Absolutely. So I see everybody on our call is muted, so I don't need to go over that housekeeping tip, which is great, but I'm going to share my screen. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, if you joined us in the last two weeks already, welcome back. But if you're just joining us now, this is the third session of our annual summit, Growing Together. And my name is Marcella. I am the Communications and Administrative Assistant at Connecticut Food System Alliance. I'm sure you all get a ton of my emails. Um, so thank you for reading them and thank you for attending tonight. A couple of things before we start. Um, please mute yourself while others are speaking. Um, if you have the opportunity to ask some questions, feel free to unmute yourself, but otherwise please stay muted. We are recording this session. Um, and for those of you joining us virtually, you can put your questions in the chat um, and we'll be happy to field those questions throughout the evening. So first I wanna thank Grace Farms and Fairfield County's Community Foundation for hosting a watch party of this event. Um, I really hope that this leads to future collaboration and I'm so glad to see so many people in attendance. Um, and I'd also like to thank those of you who attended in person. Um, this is the first time we're ever doing an event like this and I hope it paves the way for future events. Um, and I hope that it's a welcome back to in-person collaboration. Um, and I wanna thank the steering committee members who are at Grace Farms. Um, I believe Peggy, Allie and Alexa are there. Hi everyone. So a little about the Connecticut Food System Alliance. Um, we are a statewide network of dedicated stakeholders committed to creating broad system change and advancing a just, equitable, sustainable food system in Connecticut. We are committed to food justice. And food justice seeks to ensure that the benefits and risks of where, what, and how food is grown, produced, transported, distributed, accessed, and eaten are shared fairly. So your input at these sessions will help shape the food action plan. The food action plan is a vision for what food and farms should look like for a city, county, or state. The plan will act as a roadmap for community organizations, governments, individuals, and businesses to shape a better food system. Ours will consist of current data, what we have now, a vision of what we'd like to see, and recommendations for how we are going to get there. Right now, Connecticut is the only state in New England without a food action plan, and we are all here to change that. So why networking? Why is this a part of our summit? Um, I'll leave the details to Curtis because he definitely knows more than I do, um, but our steering committee identified networking as a key component of our activity towards a food action plan. And a goal we identified is to develop the network structure, expand and strengthen the network, build capacity and develop leadership within the Connecticut Food System Alliance. We hope to cultivate an inclusive, engaged network in service of food systems change. So I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, Curtis Ogden. Um, he is with the Interaction Institute for Social Change and much of Curtis's work with IISC entails consulting with multi-stakeholder networks to strengthen and transform food, public health, education, and economic development systems at local, state, regional, and national levels. He has worked with networks to launch and evolve through various stages of development. Um, of all of Curtis's past clients, which as you can see are many, um, I'd like to highlight his work with Food Solutions New England and Vermont Farm to Plate Network. Curtis writes regularly about networks and social change on IISC's blog. In addition to his work at IISC, Curtis is on the advisory board of Embrace Race, a member of Research Alliance for Regenerative Economics and the Emerging Networks Governance Initiative and shares the Thomas W. Haas Professorship in Sustainable Food Systems at the University of New Hampshire, where he is engaged in scholarship on the intersection of networks and racial equity. So, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn things over to Curtis. Well, thanks, Marcella. 
Uh, I want to just uh, say to Grace Farms, great to see you all there and you can hear me okay? Thumbs up, all right, from the back, wonderful. And can I just ask, is there somebody there who is um, facilitating with a mic? Yes. That's me, Curtis. Okay, wonderful. So I uh, may appeal to you throughout these uh, next hour and 45 minutes just to bring, <clears throat> bring some of the feedback from the room to the rest of us who can't be in that beautiful space. It looks, uh, looks amazing. Um, <clears throat> choking on a granola bar, <laughs> rushing to eat dinner tonight. Um, speaker dies of <clears throat> granola bar. It's the headline tomorrow. Um, it's great to be with you all. Uh, thanks for making time uh, and for joining another Zoom call, right? As if we didn't have enough during the day, you decided to sign up for one at 6 p.m. So my commitment is to try and make this as fun and as interactive as possible. This is not going to be presentation heavy. Um, but the, 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 the theme here is networks and um, hopefully by the end of this time, uh, everybody who's participating will see their world just a little bit differently, putting on these network lenses that help us see things as being more interconnected, more interrelated and more possible maybe than we think day to day. So we'll check in at the end and see how, how we've done. Um, I'm going to flip things a little bit here in the facilitator agenda just to move something we had just a bit later up front here. I just wanted to do a bit of a, a word association exercise. So networks, as a, as a friend of mine likes to say, networks are a thing. And when she says that, what she means is that they're everywhere. Everybody's talking about networks. And the more you dig into them, the more complicated and complex they seem to get. They're a thing. And they mean many different things to different people. So I wanted to do uh, this word association. So I'm gonna invite people on Zoom here in a box like me to use the chat. And then uh, we'll collect some responses from uh, Grace Farms and have those conveyed through the, the mic there. So uh, for those who are in the room, you can just write this down on a piece of paper, get it in your head. And for those of you on Zoom, when I say the word networks, what first comes to mind, either as a word, an image, a sensation, uh, what comes up for you? So in the room, Grace Farms, write those down. People are sharing here in the chat. Feel free to share more than one, those of you on Zoom. So I'm seeing from the top here, and then we'll go to Grace Farms, uh, fungi, connections, computers, connection again, communication, collaboration, internet, collaboration plus one, the uncomfy small talk of business networking events, sharing, connection again, the power of groups, and an agreement that sometimes it can feel like a stressful word. What's coming up at Grace Farms? Connection, um, shared purpose. Shared purpose. Plan. Impact. <laughs> Change. All right. Thanks for sharing those in the room. So just good to know what the starting point here is when we think about networks, I, I'm hearing that some people think about networks, meaning networking. Now I've got to go out and work a crowd. I got to do that conference thing. Um, some have these very natural metaphors when you think about mycelium and fungi. Some of you thinking about this uh, more uh, technical internet. Um, and then just uh, collaboration and connection seem to come up more often than not. Uh, of all the words that have been mentioned so far, uh, the brain getting thrown in here too, along with webs. So um, let's just keep working with this. So what, what are networks and why would we talk about networks in working for uh, a better food system? So I'm gonna invite Marcella to go ahead and share in the chat that document um, with the quotes. And I'm gonna share from my screen um, and so we're going to orchestrate this. There are eight quotes on this uh, piece of paper, uh, actually a PDF that I'm about to share on my screen. And I'm going to invite 
the Zoom group here to be a bit of a chorus. So each one of you are going to be invited to read one of the quotes that I share. Um, Becca knows this exercise because we did it recently. Um, so the idea is we'll hear different voices. We're not going to decide who does what. Grace Farms, you're going to be just invited to, to listen to the different voices uh, as we read these quotes. And um, just the invitation is, as you hear these quotes, what resonates? So resonance is actually a thing. Uh, it's shown, showing up in interpersonal neurobiology that, that we influence each other with energy and ideas can influence us. They can you know, create certain kinds of reactions. Our heartbeat might quicken. We might get goosebumps. We might gasp. We might smile. We might start nodding our head. So as you hear these quotes, see if there's anything in particular that resonates and just pay attention to that because we're going to invite you into a conversation with a partner about what resonated and why. So I'm going to go ahead and get this queued up on my screen. <clears throat> And I will just introduce each one of the, um, the people to whom the quote is attributed and then invite somebody here on Zoom to read it out nice and loud so everybody can hear. So the first probably needs no introduction. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. kicks us off with a quote about networks. Someone want to take that? I'll do it. Thanks, it Mark. really boils down to this. All life is interrelated. We're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Thank you, Martha. So just paying attention to if anything there resonates. Uh, and we're going to move on to Nailofar Merchant, who uh, is a business leader, does a lot around women in leadership and tech in leadership. So I want to take Nailofar Merchant's quote. another Zoom person. Connections create value. The social era will reward those organizations that realize they don't create value all by themselves. If the industrial era was about building things, the social era is about connecting things, people and ideas. Thank you, Becca. Next comes Grace Lee Boggs, long, long time community organizer, died at the age of 100 in Detroit. Someone want to take Grace? I can. Um, we never know how our small activities will affect others through the invisible fabric of our connectedness. In this exquisitely connected world, it's never a question of critical mass. It's always about critical connections. Very much. Reed Hoffman is a digital strategist. Someone want to take Reed's quote? Wherever you work, look beyond your words. There are always more smart people outside than inside your organization. Thank you. Valdis Krebs is a network scientist. Someone want to take Valdis? The key knowledge abilities of an organization are found in individuals, teams, projects, and their intra interconnections. The value of the organization is in its network. The structure of the organization can be viewed via the org chart, but the doing and learning of the organization happens in the white space on the organization chart. Thank you, Marcella. Then we've got Madeline Taylor and Pete Plastrick who've written a lot about how networks operate in the social sectors and in social change. We'll go. A network creates remarkably short pathways between individuals separated by geographic or social distance, bringing people together efficiently and in unexpected combinations. Thank you. I will do Nicholas Christakis, who's at Yale, actually, in Connecticut, and writes a lot about uh, public health and networks and viruses, just released something actually on COVID. And he wrote, while a network, like a group, is a collection of people it includes something more, a specific set of connections between people in the group. These ties are often more important than the individual people themselves. 
They allow groups to do things that a disconnected collection of individuals cannot. The ties explain why the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And one more person to take my friend Katja Fell Smith, who's in Western Mass, where I am, and does a lot around uh, equity and well being. I can go. Um, connectedness is a social determinant of health. The degree to which we have and perceive a sufficient number and diversity of relationships that allow us to give and receive information, emotional support, and material aid, create a sense of belonging and value, and foster growth. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, these are the quotes that we want you to uh, have, let continue to marinate a little bit and be in conversation with a partner around. So what jumped out at you about any one or more of these quotes and why? What jumped out, whether it was Dr. King, Nilo from Merchant, Grace Boggs, or the others, what, what phrase, what word, what, what caught your attention and uh, share a little bit more with your partner. Feel free to introduce yourselves if you don't know each other, of course. Um, and if you feel like you're running out of um, things to talk about with respect to the quotes, you can venture into, and so what does this have to do with food systems? Okay, what caught your attention and why? And if you get there, and what does this have to do with food systems or your work in food systems? So we're gonna do this for 10 minutes, right, Marcella? Yes, I'm going to break everybody up into smaller breakout groups. We'll have 10 minutes. We can introduce ourselves um, and have a leisurely conversation um, hitting on those points. Um, I sent the document in the chat to those of you who are here on Zoom um, and Grace Farms, those of you who are in person, you will be in a room with Curtis um, and I'll see you all in 10 minutes. All right, looks like we are all back. So we have um, a few minutes just to debrief what came up in those conversations. And I'm looking at you, Martha and Marcella, and wondering if there's any possibility for someone in the Grace Farms room to call in and use a phone as a microphone. I think the the microphone still echoes in the room. And if there was a way for somebody to call into Zoom and just use the phone, it might be clearer. Marcello, are you gonna send the link? They should have it, but you're gonna. I can send a link to somebody. Um, okay. I'll text you right now, Allie. Wonderful. So while you're doing that, Marcella, um, just wanted to ask uh, people on Zoom, uh, meaning non-Grace Farms uh, folk there. What came up? The Grace Farms are the guest. Yeah, it's not super strong now, but... Well, I, I think in, you know, um, Christine and I were talking that it, 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 there is no stretch at all to think about, to connect the idea of networks to food systems. And it, you know, and that, um, and in fact, it's incredibly, it's an incredibly powerful concept. And you know, what I, you know, I use the phrase that I use a lot, which is everybody eats. So everybody's part of that network. And so what is like, you know, how do you then try to use like network science and network theory and network art to be able to get as many voices into that conversation effectively as you can? Thanks, Martha. Others on Zoom? What came up? Felt resonant? Would you like to share with others? Um, the idea of networking being something that's inescapable because um, we exist all together and that mutuality is part of like living and connecting with people on like a very basic level. So it's kind of inescapable to cultivate a network, whether, I mean, whether you know you're doing it or not. Um, so that word in um, 
Dr. King's quote was something that I think stuck out to our group. And after it was pointed out to me, it, it's been sticking mm. with me since. Mm. So networks are inescapable. I mean, we actually, we only live and breathe, but for networks, right? Uh, the networks inside of us, the networks that are part of us, the networks that are larger than us. Um, and that's what network science is showing in uh, many different ways. In fact, Martha, your, your comment just made me think of this paper that I just saw going around that I put in the link here, which is um, a paper out of U Madison, bringing network science to uh, the study of distribution um, routes in the Midwest for thinking about how can we think in more fractal, resilient ways so that we can create much more um, dependable uh, distribution routes that would support local and regional food systems. And one of the big conversations that's been coming up in uh, New York State, I've been facilitating roundtables as New York State is looking to create its own food vision that would kind of mirror the New England food vision. Distribution routes keep coming up over and over again. The isolation of communities, things that are not connected, or the fact that there are certain routes that everybody depends upon. And if they go down, well, this is what we've been talking about for a while with global supply chains that the pandemic has really revealed as being much more brittle, much more fragile than maybe people would want to think. Um, so how can we create these much more intricate, much more diverse and much more robust networks of exchange, which could be about food, could be about information, could be about learning, could be about cultural sharing. So we are just scratching the surface, I think, on our understanding of networks and what they could bring to helping create just, resilient, profitable, locally and regionally profitable food systems. And you're in Connecticut where the uh, Capital Institute was born in Greenwich and they are looking at that, how we can use network science to support uh, regenerative economics. So there's a lot to get into in this conversation, but I'm getting a little bit far ahead. So I'm gonna pull myself back in here. Um, I'm gonna share a, a network story um, that to me speaks about the power of, of networks, maybe in a way that's much more relatable at the human to human level. Um, maybe building on what Michelle, you were saying about these, these, these networks are inescapable, but the degree to which we think about them or maybe are aware of them can make a big difference, right? They are just a, a fact of existence and yet sometimes we're not as conscious of them as we could be. So what happens when we become more conscious? And that's gonna be my introduction into this network story. So I'm gonna uh, go ahead and share my screen as I tell this one. And I think Becca, I did not tell this one to the NOI, so this hopefully is new ground. It is about the same um, uh, entity uh, for another network story that I like to tell. Um, and the reason I tell this story is because it is um, one that I'm very intimately familiar with, uh, have been involved with, um, and it's really cool what has happened over time. So the Barr Foundation is the largest funder in the state of Massachusetts. And about 15 years ago, they were looking at their philanthropic giving and the leader at the time, who is no longer the leader now, was somewhat of an in, unconventional leader, uh, is a friend, um, Pat Brandis. And she was wondering what could philanthropy do differently um, that could really shake things up in the name of creating um, more successes uh, in their areas of focus, which include climate change and education and culture and the arts and uh, addressing disparities of all kinds, um, while also bringing about sort of unique approaches uh, to, to engaging that maybe you didn't typically see in nonprofit organizations. And so Pat put a, 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 made a bet and, and, and in fact, there were many in philanthropy that thought she was a little crazy when she did this. Um, she said, we're just going to fund a bunch of fellows, 
We're going to start in year one with 12 fellows who are unique leaders. Um, and they are from all across greater Boston. They are from different sectors, from different topical areas and issue areas of focus, uh, diverse in terms of race and gender and ethnicity and age. What would happen if we brought people together and basically said, we just want you to hang out? That's what we want you to do is we want you to hang out and we want you to learn from each other. And Pat said, I bet amazing things are gonna happen. So they actually funded 12 leaders to have a sabbatical for three months, to have somebody fill in for them and to hang out. I mean, not to hang out, but to engage in some learning journeys together. They would take them to places outside of Boston where they would get um, Get a little feedback. All right. Um, where, uh, where being in an unfamiliar place would have them kind of looking at each other more <laughs> than being on familiar territory and the temptation to go to the office or just kind of step into familiar roles. And, um, and they invited them just to learn from each other. Um, and some amazing things started to happen. It was already planned that they would not just do this for one cohort because Pat thought we need to do this with several cohorts. So we'll start with one and then we'll start another cohort in the middle of this first one starting and they'll go through a similar experience. And so we'll bond these cohorts of 12, but then we'll start mixing them together and see what happens. And these were people who some of them knew each other, many of them did not. Because again, they were from different parts of the city, different sectors, different cultural backgrounds. And so what happened is they started to map what was going on in this community. And so what you see here on the screen on the left is the Bar Fellows Network, such as it was when they brought that first cohort together. So you see these nodes that are brought together by the big green node, which is the foundation. And who the foundation um, had connections with. So some of the people in the fellowship were known to the foundation. Others were applicants that heard about it but had no direct tie to the foundation. Some of those people had connections to each other. Many did not. And if they did have connections, it was only to a few. You can see one red dot on the left here that was a little bit more of a hub that had multiple connections. And then after running this program for four cohorts, they mapped again. And as a result of having brought people together in the individual cohorts, but then across cohorts, bring the cohorts together to mix, you see the map on the right side. So many, many more connections, much more density, we would say because you've got um, many more of these nodes packed in closer together. And so my question is, um, why does this matter? <laughs> what, what, is, what is the right-hand picture telling us? What's the story you might make up about what's, what's happening here on the right side? Anybody in the room there at Grace Farms, hopefully using the phone, anybody on Zoom? So just to step in, the phone isn't going to work for Grace Farms. So um, if someone can unmute the call at Grace Farms and try to speak clearly into the microphone, um, that's going to be the best way. Uh, sorry, the feedback was, um, was the phone call. But looking at this, um, it seems really interconnected, like uh, everybody knows each other and everyone has some connection elsewhere. So that definitely is part of the story here. Yeah. Um, for me here, excuse me. Um, for me here, it's, it's like a brain network. So when there is, for, for example, um, uh, uh, first information, the, the, we're looking for um, to find, for example, our way by connecting for different people as landmarks. And these landmarks try to, in our brain work, try to connect um, landmarks and to connect a lot of information to have 
a mental map. And here I can see it as, um, as a mental map <laughs> and as uh, different landmarks connected to each other in order to uh, maybe uh, find our way and find a way to a purpose to, to reach, for example, a goal. Mm. So I'm trying to explain this differently because um, I'm from France, it, English is not my, my native language. <laughs> so, so I'm here from Paris, so it's, it's really late here. So um, I'm a, a cognitive researcher, so I'm, I'm having a PhD in cognitive science and I'm interested a lot in networks, uh, networks in our brain, but also human networks. And I think that um, if you can connect uh, different, different uh, scientific fields, if you can connect uh, between foods and health, connect between food and ecology, between food, food and, uh, and for example, arts, between food and education, um, we can find better the way for uh, a better world. Beautiful. Magnifique. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> Um, so the um, yes, absolutely. So this, these connections bringing together different parts of this, this landscape, or if you think about this as a social brain, uh, you think about this as different disciplines coming together. When things are connected, it changes the things that are connected, right? It changes what is possible here. And so that's exactly what happened with the people who were coming together. They started to become different and the connections started to make new possibilities um, very evident to them. And so this is another map that shows what happened when these leaders were allowed to just self-organize on their own. So there was a dynamic where the leaders would say, okay, foundation, tell us what you'd like to do. I mean, really. And the foundation said, we want you to get to know each other. And as new ideas come up, bring them to us and we'll consider supporting them. Uh, but they really wanted to give them time to just be on their, their, their own for a while. And what was interesting is that there was this natural gravitation toward focusing on education and on youth development, whether they were focused on arts, or poverty, or environment, or public health, or climate change. It kept coming back to youth and education. And so what you see here, which is a landscape map, it's another form of network map, shows the hubs of what was pulling different fellows in. So there was a critical mass of fellows that became very interested in the Boston Thrive in Five initiative and started working together on that. There were many across cohorts that started getting interested in uh, working together on student and parent organizing. You see the Boston Promise Initiative, the Promise Neighborhoods Initiative, which is about more than youth, but has a large focus on youth and education. Um, a number of people came together and supported an application together, which was unheard of in Boston, given the competition. Um, and a new school was created in Boston. And so when left to their own devices of getting to know each other and having real talk with one another within and across cohorts, they started to network and focus on these education clusters, which was very, very interesting. Um, and many other things started to come out of this experience as well. So I'm actually going to play a video that uh, the Bar Fellowship put together that speaks to the power of what was created. And hopefully, I'm gonna to look to you, Marcella, to make sure I'm not blowing anybody out of the room with my audio here. So this is the fellows in their own words um, of what that coming together in these networked ways meant and, and led to. I really got the message that we were supposed to concentrate on the experience we were having and on the other people around us and not concentrate on collaboration that would happen later or work you want to do. And so I, I think the fact that 
you put 12 people at a time who do this work for a living and then you become part of 36, 48, et cetera. You got to figure that some talk about work and some possible overlap is going to emerge. But there was no force saying that. Right. It really happened naturally and organically. It's such a rich social capital petri dish and you don't really know what's going to come out of it. It's really opened up uh, conversations and so I can have a conversation with someone who actually wants to start a school and uh, in a neighborhood that I'm working in who wants a new school that's a quality school and we make that work. The kind of synergy that has happened and that I know will continue to happen into the future wouldn't be possible if that petri dish that you're referring to doesn't have the necessary you know, elements for these organisms to grow and blossom. There are some specific things that have happened that wouldn't have happened without the fellowship. There's a running joke among our staff. Be careful when Jesse and John get together because you know, new ideas and new work will follow. At one point in, in one of the working groups on housing, I looked, looked around, there were like bar, five bar fellows sitting around the table. So not only were we there because we were interested in housing but uh, or in community building, but uh, we also had this other relationship that strengthened the conversation. It gives us uh, really almost like the responsibility uh, to have to check in with each other in a way that I don't think if we were bar fellows, we would uh, feel inclined perhaps to do. And there's all kinds of things that'll ripple from that. But we, but we understand what's available and we have networks and relationships that changes the possibility of what we can do. And so countless things have, have, been, have been created and started because of it. Immediately, we were talking about education all the time and about how we might do a school together. But we wanted to do it bilingual. We wanted to do it culturally uh, relevant. So Meg and her usual <laughs> drive said, okay, we need to meet with this person. We need to meet with this person. And then uh, we started thinking, what would it look like? Would it be a shorter school? We really went through it really fast in terms of we need to make this happen. In the very first year, before it even existed, it was the third most selected high school in the city of Boston. I think we just felt like we had the bar fellows, not just our class, but other classes. They were the wind behind us. Quite simply, besides the bar fellowship, if that hadn't existed, there wouldn't be the school. The Boston Promise Initiative is in fact an initiative that came out of the bar fellowship network. The word about Boston before that was that there's no way Boston can get its act together to do this because there's way too many folks doing different things. And the only way the whole city was able to come around one applicant and one sort of idea of how to launch this is because we had this like really robust network of, of leaders around the city around it saying, this is how we're gonna do it. And I think a huge benefit of the fellowship is we skipped a lot of the pre stuff. It, it, I think, accelerated and made easier a process. We still, there's still hard work to do. I can't take that away, but I think it, um, it enabled that in a way that probably wouldn't have been enabled otherwise. What you've seen up to now in 2013 in terms of what the Bar Fellowship has been able to create and the synergies that have come out of it, it's just the beginning. These relationships uh, create and the, the joint experience have created a new sense of possibilities in Boston. So curious, uh, what reactions y'all have to that story? What resonance, how does it connect with your work in food systems? What's, what's coming up? Can I just ask a question? Do they still do this? Are they still forming they, cohorts or? They do, yes. My colleagues at the Interaction Institute are currently facilitating the, another cohort. So it's continued eight years beyond that video. Uh, there's been an article written up uh, in the Stanford Social Innovations Review called Networking a City. Uh, and since then, it's also led to very interesting um, who's running for public office in Boston uh, in terms of uh, racial diversity, gender diversity can, can be tied to this fellowship. In terms Are they still focused on education as the primary kind of like driver? Uh, education is one, uh, yes, one of the big drivers, but not the okay. only one. Yeah, yeah. 
as Mark Chala says here in the, 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 the chat, he said relationships and networks in the same sentence, but where do those lines blur? Do you have some sort of relationship with those in your network? Curtis, you have a comment here. Yeah. Just sort of a funny story about this that sort of extends the network impact. I was with the GE Foundation for about 10 years, and when we moved in the first year of the connect, we sort of anticipated the same level of um, you know, when we got into different cities across the United States, there was this feeling among particularly other philanthropists that this is what we do. We have a corner on this market, we own education, we own healthcare locally. And when we got to Boston, we got in touch with our foundation, and immediately it was a totally different experience. So there's this invitation in, it was trying to share learning with the Gene Foundation. It was sort of asking how we might collaborate and how they could amplify what we were wanting to do. And I think that in this way that you lead with culture. And you leave with this open handedness that leads to greater impact. I mean, indeed, the goal is you want to transform a city, or you want to transform the food equity space, or you want to transform supply chain. Opening your hands the way the Bar Foundation clearly has done with that group, but also with the foundations, leads to sustained impact. Mm -hmm. And you're not trying to rely on each other's actions, but really you're able to divide and conquer while still holding hands with one another. So I, I've been so impressed by, by that. my own personal experience. It's also wonderful to see, oh, right, this is just how we do their work. And this is how we might all do our work. Thank you. Uh, something that Marcella said in there struck me. Um, she said, as you said, Curtis, um, do you have some sort of a relationship with those in your network? And really what I noticed in the video and with Marcella just saying that is that it looked like these people were friends like not just people working together, but they had friendships. Like they talked about things that were important to them, probably like about kids, their kids' baseball games or something like that. Like there was a comfortableness um, in there. And I think that we forget to make room for that sometimes, mm. that there's an important importance in just the relationship um, because for, for my friends, I will immediately drop something and go to their aid if they ask for my help. And I think sometimes if it's, there's a barrier there because it's work, quote unquote, it's, um, you lose some of that investment. Mm -hmm. um, so what if we were to, in a sense, enjoy each other, get to know each other beyond just the work that we're doing? Because most likely the work that we're doing is creeping into all of the aspects of our lives. Because, I mean, this room is filled with passionate people that are... Um, you know, striving to do good work. So it's, it's naturally going to, to come out. Um, so thank you for sharing that thought, Marcella. And um, yeah, I, I just, <laughs> I want to make more friends, guys. <laughs> I will be your friend. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I think so, one of the things that, that came up for me was the, um, when you showed the picture of kind of like the nodes, you know, the, the node light and then node intense, it, the thing that occurred to me was one of my favorite exercises that I've ever, you've ever done in groups that I've been in, which is the completing the triangles. Uh -huh. And I like, you know, and I, 
couldn't help but think in that picture on the right, just how many connections that would not otherwise likely have been made were completed as a result of that. And it's just, it almost gives me goosebumps to think about the power in that, that, you know, people you wouldn't, whose paths you would never cross, but for the work of the network. Powerful. I, I saw in the video, the video motivations and um, uh, they are, they were, sh maybe they share the same vision so even if they come from different horizons, um, the, they share the same vision. So uh, connections is becomes more strong, uh, strong maybe stronger. And um, the two of them uh, seem so um, enjoying what they what, what they are doing. So um, yeah, uh, I I agree with Bika. So. Um, uh, I, I was um, uh, happy to see they they share their happiness, they share their joy. So we, we want to uh, to be able to connect with the others and to um, to um, to find um, more confidence to go to the people that we don't know and to share our thoughts and to build new connections, even if sometimes a language is a, a barrier is worse. And um, I'm here without. Um, I was not <laughs> thinking about talking in English. I was just uh, thinking that I'm going just to listen, not be passive than active. So um, it's a good thing to um, thank you to, to um, for this asking us to um, to share our thoughts and be active more than than mm. passive. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you for receiving being the invitation and uh, <laughs> taking that taking that risk or stepping into your discomfort. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's what it takes, right? To bridge some of these boundaries, to cross these thresholds and to create these new possibilities. And of course we can't be friends with everybody, uh, but you know, thinking about where ties that are stronger can be helpful. And there is such a thing as weak ties as well that can also really help facilitate things. Um, so this is just, again, taking us a little deeper into thinking about, you know, what do the nature, what does the nature of our connections have to say about what's going on uh, that uh, we want, don't want, and what can playing with connections do to create something else? So I'm gonna introduce another exercise. Uh, so again, people on Zoom will break it out and in the room there, you'll be invited to do this in pairs. I think this will be easier to do in pairs or trios. Um, and uh, Marcella, if you could put the, the, the nested circle exercise in. Um, some of you may have done this before, uh, but we're gonna ask you to do a little bit of uh, network mapping um, and it won't take that long because we don't have that much time. So this is, these are two pages that come from my friends at the Network Leadership Training Academy in Colorado. Um, Danielle Varda, who is a network scientist, um, she and I have collaborated on a few things. And this was from one of the gatherings in Colorado when we were still doing those things. Um, and so the first page, whether you have this document or you just want to use a piece of paper um, and use a pen, the first page has these three concentric circles and it asks you to think about work or a project, something that you're working on where a network should come to mind, different people that you work with or depend on or communicate with to get that thing done. And so you get to be at the center here you are at the center of the universe here. And then you're invited in the first circle to write the names of your really close personal ties. So these are the people in that network related to that project or that initiative who you have the greatest trust, most familiarity, most contact with. So those are your closer personal ties. Then out from that, you're invited to think about who are people who are a little, one step removed from that, who are strong ties. They aren't part of the inner circle in terms of carrying that out, but are strong ties. And then there's a third circle where you're asked to think about who are the weak 
ties. So people who you're still in touch with, coordinate, communicate, to carry that thing out, but much less frequently, much less point of, point of connection. Don't worry too much about the exact definitions of, of these, what's close, personal, strong, weak. Just use your intuition, don't overthink it. Um, but think about that project or that, 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 that bit of work that you're carrying out um, and, and put in those names. And then the second asks you to, based on what you've listed, start mapping. So you put yourself as the central node here and then you can start writing nodes for your other network members. Now, obviously you're gonna be connected to all of them the stretch here is for you to think about how those people in your network are connected to each other. So that it's not just you hub and spoke because that's what networking does, right? It's sort of when you network at a conference, it puts you at the center and you have all these lines going in. You're trying to visualize a network and how it's connected to itself. Maybe getting along the lines of digging into some some of the questions I heard Martha raising when you see you know these these when you start to close these triangles what what could become possible that's where we're we're heading. So page one just list the people. Page two start to map them out. Don't worry about getting it right exact, um, pretty. Just nodes start connecting them. Think about who's connected to whom. Work with a partner on this. Uh, we'll do this for uh, about 15 minutes. So you each get a chance to do this. So in the room, pair up. On Zoom, you'll be in small groups, 15 minutes for this. And then just pay attention to what comes up as you do this. What questions, what ahas, what wonderings as you look at your uh, community through a network lens, meaning that work community, that project community. Marcella, you're ready to send people? Thanks, Curtis. Okay. Yep, everyone will be sent into different rooms. Um, and I'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. Great. Welcome back. <laughs> so uh, let's see what came up first uh, for the my, my Zoom mates here. Anything you want to share about uh, what came of doing that exercise with somebody? Well, I'll talk a little bit about our group because we had Becca who had just done the exercise and um, Christina and I are both very new to Connecticut. I think we've both been here for only two years and over the course of those two years, most of it has been virtual interface. So actually we were talking a lot about the barriers that that has, um, oh, the barriers and the advantages that that has had over this time. like. Um, I personally felt like it was really hard to cultivate more meaningful friendships and relationships trying to sit in a school classroom that's virtual or um, I, I started working at Connecticut Food System Alliance and it was virtual. So, you know, there's some gaps there when it comes to getting to know people. But on the other hand, um, you're likely going to be in spaces that geographically are difficult to connect so in that way, there was a little bit more diversity in some rooms. Um, you got a chance to talk to some people that you wouldn't normally talk to. So it kind of made network building in this new state and in this new like way of communicating like a different challenge, but with different advantages. So we spent a lot of time talking about that. Interesting, thanks for sharing Michelle. Others in the Zoom room? Well, Yasmin and I had a, um, we, we, actually, we actually got ourselves kind of caught up in, in thinking about trying to map in the circles, trying to map the food system itself, <laughs> which, which probably like, okay, so that, that, that became a rabbit hole, but it was like, but then we decided that everybody kind of like, you know, because back to the principle that everybody eats. And so everybody, regardless of whether they realize it or not, are part of the system. And so part of the network that, you know, that there are a lot of 
people on that outer circle with weak ties to the notion that they and their power within the system exist and that they, um, but maybe they don't realize it. And so part of the work is to figure out how to bring folks in with the weak ties a little deeper into that circle so that you can have, you know, like, you know, so that there's more in, you know, intentional action around your interaction with the food system and your decisions about it. And so that, you know, so that, that kind of worked, even though it felt a little overwhelming. So. <laughs> Some good questions came out of that though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because every network has a core and it has a periphery. And you know, it's not one that is better than the other, but there are certain dynamics around that that could be important to pay attention to. If there's a certain consistent core that's always the core, what does that mean, right? For the core or for possibilities? What does it mean to bring, bring some who are peripheral for whatever reason, are they on the periphery into the center? And what does that do for the network, right? Um, so switching up the nature of ties, weak ties, strong ties, who's at the center, who's at the periphery. This is, these are not value judgments. Of course, we can talk about peripheral as being somehow negative and central as being good, but everybody can't be at the center. <laughs> um, and so what does it mean in a certain network that these people are at the center or these organizations are, and these are at the periphery? Um, and how can we be strategic and intentional uh, in terms of what that means for what we're trying to do? What about uh, Grace Farms room? Any any anything you want to share there? Um, we had kind of this. Oops, I had the same um, observation. I realized that we there were some entities in, in the weak ties that were outside of our geography um, for the that were bad match, which was a Fairfield County Community Foundation uh, nonprofit consultants network, and it, it made me realize you know I need to do some work to to bring the, those two out of geography um, organizations closer in because they made the network stronger. And the, those were um, the Heart Foundation for Public Giving, um, which is a very large community foundation now, and the UB Foundation for a Greater New Haven. So it was a good exercise to make, make me realize I have some work to do to, with those two organizations. And how Great, thanks for sharing. Great insights. So this is what, you know, actually working with a map without worrying about getting it exact or right, um, but getting a general sense of who's in close, who's further out, how they're tied to each other, and what this is creating as possibilities or limiting as possibilities is really the invitation of thinking like a network, as I would sometimes like to say, uh, and acting like a network. So if, it, if, we, if we put any credence in this idea that the ties are as important as what's tied, then we really wanna get curious about the nature of those ties. So I'm gonna just uh, present a few more slides and then open it up for some um, discussion before we wrap up for this evening. Um, and this is where I'm gonna get a little bit into some of the network, uh, the network science um, or the theory anyway. So you all have been thinking about your, uh, you know, your own networks for pulling off a project or getting your work done. Um, Pete Plastrick, and Madeline Taylor, who were one of the quotes that we read earlier. In 2006, they wrote a paper called Net Gains, which you can still find on the web. Uh, they wrote two versions of it, and one was very specifically for the non-governmental uh, public sector and thinking about how can we harness network theory and science to work for social change. And they talked about there being three different kinds of networks. Um, I, don't, I don't like thinking about it in terms of kind, but maybe modes of network, modes of network activity. And I use somewhat different language here, but so there are three different modes, 
connectivity, alignment, and coordinated action. And this is not meant to say that these are linear or that one is better than the other, but to say that generally all, all networks are built on a foundation of connectivity, right, of connections. And some are just about connectivity. That is, they build strong connections and trust. And through those connections, you may be sharing knowledge, you might be creating new knowledge together. You might be developing an understanding of the bigger state of the system, the food system. But it's really mainly about relationship, information sharing, knowledge generation. And so connectivity in and of itself can create value. Um, again, if it's shared information, shared knowledge, shared understanding, new knowledge, trust, that can create possibilities, as we saw with the Bar Fellows, of twos and threes and fours going off from the, from the broader network, perhaps, to do some things on their own. Another network mode could be alignment, where you're not just looking at these connections and trust, but I think this is what Yasmin was talking about when you then have some kind of shared purpose. Even if you aren't working all together, if you're aligned around a vision, if you're aligned around core values, if you're aligned around some kind of shared intent, it's kind of like the thousand flowers blooming now pointing in the same direction. Or, you know, there's a little more momentum in a common direction. You might be working still in parallel, but you're, you're going to the same general direction. And so alignment uh, can be a powerful network mode. Um, and then certainly another one is, is moving into formalized, coordinated mass action of some kind. And so that could be carrying through advocacy or some kind of uh, prototyped or common project, a, a support venture or fundraising or creation of new infrastructure. Um, and so generally we like to say that coordinated action built on a firmer foundation of trust right, connectivity, shared analysis, and alignment. You're pointed in a similar direction, vision and values, can create more powerful and, and long-standing coordinated action. But it doesn't always be, you know, go that way. I've worked with networks, for example, uh, I, I helped to start the New Hampshire Food Alliance, and it was hard in the early days to kind of get this foundation of trust going until um, a policy advocacy opportunity came up and people got jazzed and excited and united and did that thing together and then looked at each other and said, hmm, what else could we do? And that's where we kind of came back to building some trust and relationship. And so what are you up to? And what am I, you know, sort of building relationship absent that kind of thing that we would do wasn't working for that particular group at that particular time. Um, and we like to say that there are different kinds of um, support roles that can be key for carrying out these different uh, network functions or modes. So connectivity is, is, is weaving. So there are actually formalized network weaver roles now. Um, you see job descriptions for them. These are people who are there to knit the web, uh, which is uh, introducing people to one another and encouraging sharing, um, sort of animating the network, if you will. And around alignment, uh, that's where facilitation, someone who has really deft facilitative skill to be able to get all those actors to agree that there is something more in common that they hold as a vision, as values, um, as maybe even overarching goals that they're still pursuing, perhaps somewhat independently. And of course, action, you need somebody who's really deft at coordination. And so the networks that I've helped to uh, support over the last uh, 15 years, it's been a lot about figuring out what are the roles that are needed? What are the functions that we need to fill? And what is it we're trying to do with this network first? What needs to be done? trust, alignment, should we just jump into something together and try and pull something off? 
Um, and so that's always a, a good conversation to have with a network uh, up front when it's trying to formalize somewhat. And just to back up and say that, you know, what these networks are able to do when they really get humming are to deliver on what are called in network theory and science network effects. So when networks are built in a certain way, they can do things that singular organizations or individuals can't do. They can be more adaptive, right? They can change, they can adapt to changing conditions, especially if there's a lot of information sharing. So you hear this in the farming world right now, um, you know, of uh, our friend Dorn Cox, who's up at Wolfneck Farm in New Hampshire is trying to create uh, open farm and open teams where farmers can and put in sensor technology at low cost into the soil and share climatic changing conditions and also ways that they are dealing with changing climate and to do that very quickly and freely so that people can adapt. Um, networks can also uh, achieve a certain kind of resilience when they're not just a hub with a bunch of spokes. Because if the hub goes away, so goes the network. But when you get a multi-hub or a very dense network, there's greater resilience. A node can go away and it can still maintain its integrity. So you can see what happens in a city when you've got a lot of competition amongst nonprofits and they're not working together and then you lose a crucial, lose a crucial node. It's just, it's just less resilient to absorb shocks. Um, the small world reach factor of, uh, you know, I think what Marcello, Marcello was saying in terms of, you know, being able to, to meet, you know, certain people, <laughs> uh, somebody else, oh, well, Yasmin being here and the, the international factor here of being able to connect across geography and culture can uh, create learning we didn't have access to before in exchange. Um, and certainly rapid dissemination is another feature of networks where you can get information out more quickly. Of course, there's a lot of noise now with the web and so, and, and so on, but with this digital technology, with these powerful second brains, or maybe these are becoming our first brains that we carry in our pockets, we can really get things out there much more quickly. And so when I work with social change agents, we're thinking about these factors, you know, to the extent that we need to get things out quickly, build in resilience, build in adaptive capacity, um, think about how we can reach each other more quickly. And certainly that's become a big thing during the pandemic, right? In terms of mutual aid networks and um, hearing about the wonderful work that's been coming out of Connecticut in particular, I know in Hartford and New Haven and uh, Bridgeport on those fronts. So if you already have a network, then it can get to work. <laughs> if you've got to conjure it up, that's when you get yourselves into trouble. And there's also something to be said just for what happens when networks are rich and vibrant, not just for these mega effects they can have, but what's the value for the people who are participating? And colleagues and I have done a number of different uh, network evaluations where we ask people, why are you in this network? What keeps you coming back? And people come back for the learning. People come back for the collegiality. People stay because they feel like they get an access to a bigger picture that they don't when they're isolated, to getting new resources, to uh, just being proud to be as associated with something bigger that can also amplify their voice, uh, especially if you're a smaller organization. And in the best networks, you're not just dividing up the pie into smaller bits, but you're growing the pie. And so that there's access to more when people are being leading with an ethic of generosity. And then there are all these new partnerships, joint projects and activities that can, um, can, can, can result from all of this activity, much like the Bar Fellows, right? Which was banking on that feature of emergence. We can't anticipate what will happen, but when we mix things up and people up, new things will happen, especially when there's that trust and that understanding and that motivation. So last thing, just to kind of take this back down to the micro, is that this all is based on dyads, right? If we weren't connecting one-to-one, -one, none of this would be possible. And so this is where thinking like a network weaver, even when it sometimes feels like it's, but it's so small, can yield really big impacts. 
And so what is network weaving as opposed to networking? Well, a network weaver is somebody who in this kind of array of network leadership roles, again, comes back to really thinking about how are things and people connected and what's moving through those connections and what does that make possible? At the very basic level, what they're doing is they're closing triangles, which is what Martha said earlier, right? So it's not making a hub with many spokes. It's saying, how are those spokes connected to each other? So if I know Marcella and I know Becca, but they don't know each other, and I think that it would be great for them to know each other personally, professionally, I introduce them. So that's great for them, but it's also in the larger scheme, when we're connecting A, B, and C, we're connecting their networks as well. So it's not just about a triangle. It's a triangle that fits into a much more dynamic and complex geometry that can bring in new information because we're bringing our networks with us. And when we're aware of that, then there's more of us to more, more that we can connect to. And that's the story of these networks. This is a story I've told uh, to the Network Leadership Institute for Food Solutions New England, but similar to the Bar Fellows. It's taking over time a network that looks like this and makes it look like this. Triangles closing, intricacy, diversity, robustness, when people are sharing, right? When things are actually moving and flowing is a recipe for long-term human prosperity. These rich, dynamic, intricate, robust webs. And so as weavers, we're thinking about who can we connect that uh, are alike? We're trying to bond people. Who are we trying to broker and bridge? And what can these things uh, actually do for not those individuals? Yes, for those individuals, but the whole, right? What can it do for our communities? What can it do for our supply chains? What can it do for innovation? What can it do for community resilience? Um, so there's a whole science and art to thinking and acting like a network weaver. Uh, and so I'm going to pause it there and just see what questions, comments are coming up in the room before we start to wrap up. How is this landing for folks? What feels relevant? What feels confusing? Anybody in the room? Anybody on Zoom? I'm thinking about that um, pyramid you showed and where would like a resistant but necessary like potential network member fall and is it worthwhile to engage um, either a group or a, a person with influence who might be resistant, but is a necessary force for your organization's goal of change. I don't know if that makes sense as I'm saying it out loud. So they're a potential influencer, powerful person, uh, and yet there is resistance or there, there, there might be resistance. I'm gonna say might be resistance. Um, how do you maneuver that as a part of your network and is it worthwhile to try to cultivate that? I mean, if you don't know there's resistance and your sense is that there is a, a, you know, a real a value to bring that person in, I think that's where you have, you have a conversation. Um, you, know, you engage in good old one-on-one -on -one relational organizing as Marshall Gans likes to talk about, uh, if people are open to that um, and sharing that this is what we're up to. What are, you, what are you up to? This is what we care about. What do you care about? And is there, is there a point of intersection? I think the a thing that comes up for me and, and I'm not, uh, let's see if I can articulate this right, that you know, if you, if you look at your picture with all of your nodes, um, that when you're trying to do system change, um, be it on climate, on food, on kind of like housing, kind of like any of these big issues on which government is a significant player, it's like how, how do you make sure that some nodes aren't more important than other nodes 
you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that it's kind of like that that when you when you're in a system in which like where an impact anywhere is felt everywhere that the players with the bigger nodes i don't know that can i don't know i don't even want to go with that imagery but it's like you know that 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 they can play an outsized role an outsized influence and that's not necessarily the healthy state so, but it happens in a lot of a lot of the work we do. So, is that? I don't know if that. There's not really. A, there's a question in there somewhere. I don't know if that makes sense. That concept makes sense. Well, it's it's reminding me of uh, a conversation I had with a, a somebody else who does network uh, science and who is saying that in um, in many networks, ten to fifteen percent. Of, of the network has sort of outsized influence on the network. And uh, that's because of three kind of primary um, roles that these uh, outsized influencers can play. They can be hubs, which means they just have many, 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 many connections. They can be gatekeepers because they have much information, much knowledge and resources. Or um, they can be pulse takers who are kind of under the radar, but really know how to play the network. <laughs> and that can be helpful for them, but it may or may not be helpful for the network as a whole. So like all social organization, power is always at play and it's good to be aware of that. And it's good to be aware then of where those nodes might be situated in the network. Uh, we were very aware at the beginning of Food Solutions New England that, you know, there was a lot of conversation about big ag and larger um, food system organizations and shouldn't they be brought in. And the concern was that they would just run the agenda. So yes, they may or may, may not be important to what we're trying to do, but bringing them into the fold too close to the center just felt like it was going to jeopardize, you know, the integrity. So I think it's just good to be smart and, and have those conversations. I don't know, I have no idea if I answered your question, Martha, but. Uh, I think you actually well, answered I, I mine. I don't know if there is an answer to it, but, but I think that the, the important concept there is awareness that it is that not all, that not all nodes are equal. Um, in, in influence and kind of like, what do you do with that? And how do you build the power where power needs to be built if it's not, if it's not kind of like, if it's not naturally occurring, you know, yeah. so yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that if I, if I can, uh, yeah. uh, if I could talk, I think that um, we have to find maybe the balance because for example, when you choose um, if I take an example about our body, there is a lot of organ, there is a heart, there is a kidney, there is a kidney. And so I think that's um, uh, a trance of the time, maybe the heart is going to take the power and sometimes it's the, the kidney that's going to take the power. I think that in this Montel map that all of these nodes are go going maybe at one, at one time taking the power because they are going to uh, make a change and then pass to the others to make the um, I don't know if I'm, I'm I'm trying to explain it <laughs> trying to translate from French to English it's not easy for me but I think that yes I think that um, the power don't don't have to be concentra concentrated only on one note but maybe make a balance and um, had to be uh, maybe help all the notes to have uh, their time to 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 shine, and not um, uh, concentrate all the power on only one node. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oui, ça marche, ça marche. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's also you know we talk about. I skipped over the slide, but there are so many important roles in networks, right? And so to think about the convener. Right, and who has the convening power? Right, who has the power to pull to offer an invitation, and people will actually come together? That's power you do want. Um, or who has the power to to you know the weavers are often these people have many connections that they can bring in. So there are many different forms of power, uh, 
uh, that we can embrace. And as you're saying, Yasmin, sort of celebrate and allow each to shine. I think it's when, you know, people or organizations come in and just try and run their agenda through that it gets, uh, that it gets dicey. Uh, and that exists. <laughs> and just being in a network doesn't mean that you're free of that. And sometimes it can make it worse because you don't have, you know, immediate hierarchy or organizational charts. And so there was a feminist who wrote in the 70s, Joe Freeman, the tyranny of structuralistness, uh, who wrote about how when they tried to tear down a hierarchy with uh, the feminist movement in the 70s, sometimes it made power differentials worse because they pretended that there was no hierarchy and yet people were leveraging all kinds of power that was not officially seen or recognized. So yeah, that's the fun of getting to play with, <laughs> with networks. They're not a panacea, uh, but they are, there's a lot of potential. Anything Thanks. else? Yeah. I have a question about that triangle that you shared around connectivity and alignment. Yeah. How do you know, and I'm sure this is like different for every type of network, but like, how do you know when you're like connected and like ready to align? Like, are there like, I don't know, just like key benchmarks that you're really looking for, for the group to be like, yeah, like we're ready to move to this, like also nebulous next space. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Sarah. I mean, I don't know if there's a formal way other than, you know, really just asking the question. Um, what comes to mind is I was actually working with a group of food scientists that had created these employee assistance groups. You know, this was actually a project focused on equity. And they had been more sort of peer networks, kind of connectivity nodes, just to support each other. But then they started to think, we got some power here and we should be advocating, you know, so kind of moving into more of an alignment and maybe advocacy mode. And so there was a period of just needing to check in, is this, is this what we want to do? Um, and there was another network that was an education network that had been this kind of learning network for a while. And similarly, there was a group within that said, well, we want to do something. <laughs> and so in that case, the learning network stayed and this um, subset kind of formed a sub network to do some advocacy and um, prototyping work. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing, um, but uh, it often requires some you know, good, sometimes challenging conversation, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm having a, a question about um, thinking and acting. And um, yeah, we can make connections to think about subjects, but maybe we can not are going, well, not going to act. So how can we help um, uh, a community, for example, or a group to act and what can help them to act with that kind of, um, of support that we can um, give to them to act and how we can, after acting, how we can help them to engage more because sometimes we, we, we built something and uh, there's a lot of constraints and uh, don't have time, for example, and uh, this in engagement is going to be uh, lost. In, in, we lose this engagement in the time. So I'm having two questions in, in one, <laughs> if you could consult it. Yeah, and we have one minute left. I mean, I'll say there's, a, there's a, another story that uh, Yasmin speaks to, to that, where we were working with an education network, a national network, and the short answer was we, figured out who the champions were within this network who were really ready to go to the next level of engagement. Um, they were very engaged, they were very enthusiastic. There were ways of measuring that actually through uh, a network survey, how often they engaged with the networks through social media or programming. And then really it was to pull the champions together who had a lot of energy and said, could, could you imagine doing something else together, right? Um, to take action. Um, and there is another tool we use called the engagement ladder, which looks at how there are always different levels of engagement in the network, you know, and it's always going to be fewer who are very, very engaged, but how can you at each rung nudge people a little bit up the ladder? Um, and so there are ways that you can, you can measure that in techniques that we use to just, you know, encourage that. Uh, and sometimes People don't know that there's another way to engage uh, until somebody makes the invitation. So I know we're at time. 
Uh, I love the questions, Yasmin, and happy to uh, follow up. Um, I'm going to put my email in the uh, chat here if anybody feels like they would like to follow up at some point. And um, I'm going to turn it back to Marcella and just thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Curtis. I will um, make sure to share your email with those of you who've joined us at Grace Farms, um, which thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank Grace Farms for um, hosting this event. Um, it's been a really incredible opportunity to try something new. Um, and I'm hoping to do more of these in the future, hopefully with um, more smooth technical transitions. Um, but just while you're all here, I'll try to keep this really brief. Um, we have one more session of our summit next Tuesday. Um, it'll be the final session. Um, and I hope you all can join us. Um, it will be again from 6 to 8 p.m. So bring your dinner, bring your pets, bring your family. Um, we just would love to see you there. And I want to thank all the members of our steering committee who have uh, helped plan this and who have facilitated the event at Grace Farms as well. Um, I hope that you can all find some time to connect with CFSA on social media. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about what we do, send me an email at communications at ctfoodsystemalliance.com and I can add you to our listserv. But other than that, I will let you get back to your evenings. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank and you, take care. Curtis. For, Curtis, that was amazing. So thank you so much for, for you. spending your time with us. Yeah. Yes, even Thanks. a couple of minutes later. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Au revoir. Bye. Bye.